Jeffrey Braithwaite, Professor of Health Systems Research and Founding Director of the Australian Institute of Health Innovation at Macquarie University. So I was led to a career in health services research through an interesting pathway. And I guess anybody who's a health services researcher goes through some sort of convoluted pathway. You don't wake up in the morning thinking, I want to drive a fire truck or not, and then thinking, I want to be a health systems researcher. So at first, while I trained in psychology, I didn't really become a psychologist. I went to work in the health system as a, a, a human resources practitioner, and then later as a general manager in healthcare, in hospitals and the local health districts. But really, what beckoned was teaching and research and making a scholarly contribution. Uh, and I started at University of New South Wales and then came across to Macquarie. And now I do a variety of health systems, health services research studies, uh, nationally and internationally. The Institute was formed out of some existing research centres. Research centres in university speak uh, small groups of uh, uh, scholars and PhD students and uh, professors who all work on a particular issue. So there were some pre-existing centres uh, at University of New South Wales that we amalgamated together into this bigger institute structure. There was Enrico Kawira's Centre for Health Informatics, the centre I was running at that time, and also later the centre that Joanna Westbrook, Professor Joanna Westbrook leads, who came together. And then at University of New South Wales, we were very successful. And then we moved to Macquarie for some new opportunities. So the early formative periods at UNSW were really good at creating the centre, the, the centres and the institute that we have now at Macquarie University. The Australian healthcare system is very good if you stack it up against all the health systems of the world. It's about 190 countries in the world, and you could rank all the countries on performance, how well they do, how efficient they are, how good is their quality of, of care, and how safe are those systems for patients. You could stack them all up in a ranking. And Australia, on various rankings that have been done, international benchmarks, is pretty good. It's right up there in the top five or 10 uh, health systems depending on the measure. Sometimes it's one or two. Part of that is attributable to it being quite evidence-based. And that's where we come in with health systems, health services research. We strive to provide studies that underpin how well it works, how it's reformed on an ongoing basis to be improved. And we've done a lot of studies, for example, in how much of the care delivered to the Australian population is evidence-based. These are our care track studies. And we've looked at adults and children with common conditions and said how much of the care provided is in line with evidence. By the way, it's around about 60% is in line with level one evidence or guidelines on average. It differs by different conditions. And so that's one of the pieces of work we've done to strengthen the system by pointing out where it provides good care or care that needs to be improved. The history of looking at patient safety through a different lens has quite a long history, it had quite a long genesis. So about 10 or 12 years ago, a bunch of people across the world, notably uh, Eric Holnagel in Denmark, Bob Weirs in Florida, who's dearly departed Bob Weirs, unfortunately he died, um, and, uh, and myself and some other people got together and said, we need to do something different in order to keep patients safe. Until then, most people were looking at patient safety through a lens that came to be described as safety one. And that is, how do we look at things going wrong and then do less of them? How do we reduce the amount of harm that uh, is created by health systems. Uh, and you can categorize those as adverse events or complications or near miss, misses, and that happens a lot in healthcare. 
So we thought, you know, Einstein's dictum is you can't keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. So we said, why don't we look at more uh, uh, when things go right? Now, even when we say this today, it seems a bit strange. But the question, the powerful question is, how come so many things go right in healthcare? You wouldn't believe this when you read the news, listen to the listen to the uh, uh, TV or, or watch, uh, read the papers. But um, there's a lot goes right in healthcare. A very powerful message that I think we've contributed to, we've published six books on this and lots and lots of studies and papers, is how many things go right and when and what under what circumstances do things go right in healthcare, and that's an awful lot of healthcare, and what can we learn from the systems that produce that good care, from the people who cons consistently uh, make things go right. And that's this distinction between safety one, reducing the amount of harm, and safety two, doing more things that go right. A learning health system is what it says on the tin. It's a system that's good at exploiting all the data that healthcare produces for the benefit of individual patients and groups of patients. So clinicians have a pretty tough job. The people on the front lines of care, delivering care to patients, have a pretty tough job. They've got test results, patient histories, all sorts of IT-produced data that has to be factored in to get a diagnosis, to treat patients, and then to discharge them and monitor them afterwards. So a learning health system is one that exploits all those data sets and puts facts, evidence, data in the hands of clinicians and patients so that better decisions can be made about the care that's delivered. And it's worse than I'm actually saying because it's not just those data sets like history and hist patient histories and test results that matter. There's new data now available in the sense of big data that tells you about whole populations of patients and genomics data, which tells you about the specific characteristics of that patient in front of you. And so a learning health system exploits all those data sets and says, how do we amalgamate that, make sense of it, and make better decisions? A very interesting question is if leadership and policy are good and mobilized to try and improve the health system, and the AAHA and many other people are very interested in leadership and policy as an enabler of improvement, are they sufficient is the question we need to ask. And if they're not, what is? Well, leadership and policy are kind of top-down, uh, important ingredients, good leadership, good policy, important ingredients in creating a better health system, but they're not enough. Let me tell you about a study that underpins that. So we did a review uh, of all the evidence on culture, organizational culture, good teamwork and cultural interaction uh, in 2017 and published a paper on it. And it's been cited a lot. And what that paper asks is this ingenious, I think, question. If you have a good culture, do you get better patient outcomes regardless of the leadership and the policy in place? Okay, so what we discovered in that paper was we stacked up all the studies where there'd been a measure of culture and it was related to outcomes, clinical and organizational outcomes. And what we found, most of these studies were in hospitals, but they were also in other parts of the health system, what we found was uniformly when people had measured organizational culture and it, there was a good culture, those organizations produced better patient and clinical outcomes. So my conclusion is, it's a fantastic question to say, is leadership and policy what we need and are they the key ingredients? They are important ingredients, but not the be all and end all. It's much better that we have a good organizational culture because that's going to drive better outcomes for patients and better organizational outcomes.